16th. Uh, City Clerk, roll call please. Mayor Schlachter. Here. Council Member Barr. Here. Council Member Grove. Here. Council Member Driscoll. Here. Council Member Milliman. Here. Council Member Valdez. Present. And Mayor Pro Tem Ryden is absent. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item up is the, the approval of the agenda. Council, everyone's had a chance to review the agenda. Any changes? Seeing none, it's approved without objection. Uh, item four is time for comments and reports. And I'll turn it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the council. Uh, just one tonight, just the to let you know that on Thursday, the, the city's uh, staff leadership team, which is comprised of all department heads, will be off-site at our museum for a for a uh, all-day retreat, where we'll be kind of talking about how we're working as a team and also about how we're going to meet the, uh, the challenges of this year's budget and all the challenges coming up up ahead. So uh, it'd be a good time spent away, but uh, we'll be less <coughs> less available Thursday. So that's all I have, Mayor. Okay, cool. thank you. City Attorney? No report, thank you, Mayor. Go to Council Member Driscoll. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I forgot to mention at the last regular meeting on April 19th, uh, the Littleton, uh, uh, Police had their awards ceremony, and I just wanted to congratulate everybody that uh, that was uh, recognized on that day. In particular, I want to recognize Jeff uh, Jeff Farmer, Medal of Honor, uh, Dave Snook for Medal of Valor, and Purple Heart, and James Fountain for the Purple Heart. But there were plenty more there on that list. If uh, if you can go to the website, you can probably see all the people that uh, received an award. Uh, also, I attended uh, the other day uh, at the ACC paramedics uh, program. Um, it's just a phenomenal program. Every time I go to this board meeting, I'm just amazed by what Dennis and his crew are doing over there. Uh, they had 100% graduation rate. All, all the people were in their uh, job placements, and they had 70 students graduate. So they're looking to have about another 70 to 100 students uh, this year. They also uh, got approved, as most of the city council knows, for a grant uh, that the city supported, uh, <clears throat> and it's for their simulation, uh, simulation uh, changes to their buildings. Uh, so they're going to be bringing all sorts of cool technology that uh, will be not only used by the students, but by, South Med, by the fire departments around the area. Uh, so uh, they're really excited. Uh, they, they broke, uh, they started working on, on redoing their their uh, facility uh, last week. And then finally, um, I also attended the Littleton Hospital uh, Board of Directors. Um, as a lot of you know, they're, they're breaking ground. Uh, pretty soon, they're gonna have a, a, a ribbon cutting on uh, the new facility here, um, which is a four-story uh, facility that will be um, uh, for, for heart and cardiovascular. So it's gonna be a huge, uh, uh, addition to uh, this little community hospital we have down the street and uh, I, I applaud uh, what the hospital is doing and, and uh, the name of that campaign by the way is called All Hearts uh, campaign so um, uh, and then one last thing uh, the Centure name is going to be retired uh, right now it's Littleton Centure they're joining um, the Adventist uh, group of hospitals. Uh, Adventist, I think, is based out of Orlando, Florida, but that hospital includes 53 hospitals and about 80, let's see, 83,000 teammates around the country. So it's uh, it's the eighth largest hospital in the country, and uh, so all of a sudden, our little tiny community hospital has gotten gotten uh, uh, gotten very big. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Milliman. Uh, just a couple things. South Metro Housing Options did not have a meeting this month. I think that they are on their retreat. And the Housing uh, Task Force did meet a couple weeks ago. At that time, Senate Bill 213, I think, was still being uh, uh, talked about. And uh, so there was some discussion about that. And also the Housing Task Force is uh, very excited about participating in the um, conversation about code revisions. And that's it. Thank you. Councilmember Valdez? No report. Uh, Councilmember Barr. 
Yeah, got a couple of things to report out on. Um, first, for LPS, uh, if those who have kids uh, may know that we are almost to the end of the school year, hooray. Uh, next year, the school year will be slightly longer. Um, the LPS board voted to increase the length of the, uh, the, length of the day by about 12 minutes to the elementary school day. Um, so I say this to say, uh, you know, please be aware of schedule changes and time changes in the upcoming school year. It will not be the same. And good luck to all the parents uh, as they are disembarking on this current school year. Um, for Dr. Cog, we held our annual retreat on Saturday. Um, it was a full day and a majority of that discussion was dedicated to housing. So obviously in the wake of 213 having gone nowhere, um, I think Dr. <laughs> Cog and the staff there felt that it was appropriate to continue to keep the discussion warm at least uh, in terms of who are the collaborators around housing, uh, which uh, municipal and regional structures are best suited to help organize us around these challenges. And I think the Dr. Cog staff did a fantastic job at starting with demographics. Um, and we had a kind of full presentation uh, on data and interpreted by the Dr. Cog staff from the demographer's office. We as a Denver region, yes, are still growing. We are aging more rapidly than we had ever expected. Um, and we are still not building housing quite at the re replacement rate necessary to accommodate even the, the, the uh, more restricted growth than we had seen in previous decades. Um, and we are, it turns out, the eighth most expensive housing market in the continental US. So that is a, you know, an impressive statistic. Um, I do wanna say too that they did talk about some of the uh, new opportunities with the Area Agency on Aging. And Council Member Driscoll, I'll probably be reaching out to you um, to connect with the uh, not soon to be Centura Hospital Staff Board and, and the like. Um, they, Dr. Cog is our area agency on aging. Um, oftentimes they are the kind of conduit by receiving, uh, consul uh, passing on consultative services to community-based health organizations from hospital referrals. Um, Dr. Cog's funding in this area is actually decreasing significantly at a time where we're seeing increasing uh, need. And uh, this is obviously going to be a real challenge for our region as our aging population grows. So. Uh, Dr. Cog is hoping to spearhead a lot more data management and uh, coordination with local hospital networks like even our Littleton Adventist. Um, the rest of the discussion for the Dr. Cog board retreat really revolved around, you know, what's next in terms of this discussion around housing. It's nice to have uh, lots of long-winded conversations, but who is going to take responsibility and action? And Dr. Cog really felt like their planners, their uh, you know legislative teams, their um, kind of this convening is really well placed to uh, start coming up with regional strategies, baseline discussions on housing, and us as the city of Littleton offering up the studies and research that we've conducted thus far to help uh, kind of further that discussion. So there's more to come on this, but it was a really productive session and looking forward to seeing what the Dr. Cog staff have left in store. And that's all I've got. Thank you, Councilmember Grove. Uh, yes, a couple things. Uh, first of all, at the end of uh, April, I went to uh, the Littleton Chamber Women's Networking event. It was uh, a very nice event. There was like 50 people held at Shiftworks. I've never been at Shiftworks before, so that was kind of interesting to see the inside of that. There was people from the community, people from ACC, and it was just nice to get together in an informal kind of atmosphere and chat with um, everybody from the Chamber. And it's just wonderful to see all the programs that are coming out of that uh, group in such a short time. So it's just really great uh, what uh, Corey is doing. This Monday, as a liaison to uh, CML, Colorado, Colorado League of Cities, um, they gave an update on all the bills that were uh, put before the legislature this session. They followed, they watched about 200 bills and followed about 108 of them. Uh, they took a position on uh, either neutral, oppose, or for. They talked a bit about the land use bill, and the strategy is to look at 
it will come back in some form, whether it's exactly the same or in, in something that's more uh, bits and pieces. They say they want to look at it from, and rather than being on the defensive and saying, you know, this is what we don't like about it, kind of uh, look at it from the offense and, and work with the legislators in a very different way. So it sounds like a lot of different agencies are working on housing. Uh, so I don't know how that's all coordinated, but that makes a lot of sense. Uh, there, you probably know about many of the bills that were passed. Uh, you know, the ones on car thefts, so uh, unauthorized, um, they decoupled the value of the car from, so if a car was not worth as much, it, um, now it still ha carries the same penalty as a car that's worth a lot. There was a variety of bills um, about the criminal justice system, uh, wildfire uh, codes, and uh, many that you probably read about in the news. A uh, couple things coming up. One is the meeting tomorrow. If you're interested in learning about redistricting, there'll be an open house here at the community room, as I understand it, from 3.30 to 6. And you can look at the maps and, you know, there'll be people there to talk to. Also, some of us on council are going to be attending a preservation celebration on Thursday night put on by Historic Littleton, Inc. And I wanted to say um, our condolences go out to South Suburban Board and the family of Dave Loffel. Um, he passed away uh, last week, I think it was. And we have uh, worked with him as part of our uh, liaison work with South Suburban. So we were very sorry to hear about that. Thank you. Uh, let me echo your sentiments about uh, Mr. Loffel. He was a, a good board member, and he will be missed. And that was a, a shock to find that news. So. Uh, just a reminder to council and everyone watching that tomorrow is the state of the city uh, in just under 13 hours from now at 7.30 in the morning over at Hudson Gardens. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, just a little plug for the county. The state of the county is coming up on June 7th. So you can go to the county's website and find out more about that. It's going to be over at the, the fairgrounds. Um, Last week, uh, Council Member Driscoll and I attended the Arts Partners uh, meeting over at the museum uh, to just kind of uh, watch the layout, uh, the rollout of the Lodgers tax uh, uh, project there with the, the funding and mechanisms. So there were, there was a good, the room was full of uh, people in that community and kind of eager to see how those uh, dollars are gonna be uh, uh, spent and invested back into our community. So it's great to see that going. Um, and then finally, uh, I am taking part in what's called um, the Water Fluency Program. It's put on by Water Conservation Colorado. Uh, it's going to go for the next few months. The first meeting is tomorrow, um, almost all day virtually, after the State of the City. Um, and then there'll be a couple other virtual meetings, and then there'll be a two-day kind of workshop down at Alamosa in, I think that one's in July. So I'm looking forward to that, as with, you know, housing is a big issue, but water is, is, is uh, intimately tied to housing and Colorado here. It's one of the limiting factors in all, all segments of our um, economy and environment. So uh, that's all I have on my report. All right, uh, next up is scheduled appearances, of which we have none. Uh, item six are proclamations. We have two proclamations tonight. <clears throat> First is a proclamation of the city of Littleton, Colorado, proclaiming May 14th to May 20th, 2023, National Police Week in the city of Littleton. Whereas in 1962, President John F. Kennedy proclaimed May 15th as National Peace Officers Memorial Day and the calendar week in which May 15th falls as National Police Week. And whereas there are more than 800,000 law enforcement officers serving in communities across the United States, including the dedicated members of the Littleton Police Department, and whereas the members of the Littleton Police Department play an important role safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the citizens of our community, and whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the challenges, duties, and responsibilities of their police department, and that members of our department recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, protecting them against violence and disorder, and protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression and intimidation. And whereas our police department has grown to be a modern, accredited, and scientific law enforcement agency which unceasingly provides a vital public service. Now, therefore, I, Kyle Schlachter, Mayor of the City of Littleton, do hereby proclaim May 14th through May 20th, 2023, as National Police Week in the City of Littleton, to further extend appreciation to our Littleton Police Department for the vital services they perform and their exemplary dedication to the community. 
I would like to uh, invite up Chief Enley here to say uh, a few words if he would like. Do I have to turn this on? No, you should be on. I should be on. Thank you. Thank you for this and thank you for giving me an uh, opportunity to speak to you and, and say thanks. Chief Stevens couldn't be here tonight, but he just texted me and said that I can tell you why he can't be here. And I know you're thinking like witness protection or something like that. <laughs> it's not what it is. He's actually in DC with Corporal Farmer, who is gonna be at the White House tomorrow, receiving the Presidential Medal of Valor. Uh, it is the uh, most prestigious award um, in the country for law enforcement. And I, I wanna tell you a little bit about what Jeffrey Farmer did that night on September 20th. Um, he responded to a call of shots fired, him and another officer. Uh, the other officer located the suspects and, uh, and started a, a foot chase. Corporal Farmer was involved in that foot chase and severely injured his knee in the foot chase. Um, officer Snook was the other officer that was involved. He chased them, uh, the suspect into a stairwell and when he entered the stairwell was immediately met by gunfire. He was shot nine times uh, and as he struggled for his life, Corporal Farmer heard this and uh, went into the gunfire. Uh, the suspect continued to fire at both officers with Corporal Farmer, like I said, a severely injured knee, um, was able to return fire, stay by uh, Officer Snook's side, and, and then drag Officer Snook to safety. Uh, Corporal Farmer then made the decision um, to load uh, Officer Snook into a patrol car uh, with the help of other officers and drive him to Swedish uh, Medical, where when he arrived at the ER, uh, Corporal Farmer was told that if he didn't make that decision, uh, Officer Snook would have died just from the blood loss. Um, so because of, of Corporal Farmer's actions, uh, Officer Snook's here, still here with us today. Um, and obviously clearly heroic and well-deserving of the award from the president. Um, we're humbled and honored that he's gonna do that, but I also wanna talk just quickly about everybody at the Littleton Police Department, not just Corporal Farmer. Um, the question I get nowadays is, why do people wanna be police officers today? And I used to have a little bit of trouble answering that, honestly, um, and a discussion with a friend, I think I came up with a good answer. Uh, I don't think the officers would agree with me. me. This is not macho enough, um, the answer that I'm going to give you. But in a, in a world where today there's something called defund the police or uh, demoralize the police or um, criticism from press or every decision we make will be judged, um, why would you want to do this job? And I think the answer, the simple answer that I will give you is that they love their community. They really do love their community. And they're here making sure that the community, especially the community of Littleton, um, is not overtaken by the people that want to do bad. The people that want to do what they did to uh, Officer Snook and Corporal Farmer that day. That's why they come to work every day and they're happy to do it. They really are happy to do it. If you sit back at a roll call, they will joke, maybe not if you guys are there. Well, you guys are there, or if I'm there. But I hear them, they will joke and they will laugh and they are happy to do it. Uh, and it is an honor for each and every one of us to work in this city where we have never heard from city government, from the citizens, from the council about defund the police. The only thing we hear from our community is, how can we help you? What can we give you to help that's gonna make this job better? And proclamations like this, um, go a long way in that. So thank you for recognizing all the officers. It really is an honor to represent them here. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy that this happened. So thank you. Thank you so much. You. Second proclamation is proclamation of the city of Littleton, Colorado, proclaiming May 21st, May 27th, 2023, National Public Works Week in the city of Littleton. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, emergency management, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and the public health, high quality of life, and well-being of the people of the city of Littleton, and whereas this infrastructure, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts 
of public works professionals who are federally mandated first responders and frontline team members, engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's assets. And whereas Littleton Public Works professionals work daily to manage and protect our community's infrastructure investment, provide safe roads, traffic safety, reduce congestion, protect our environment, and keep our streets free of snow and ice, and whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and the children of Littleton, Colorado to gain knowledge and maintain ongoing interest and understanding of the importance of public works, first responders, and public works programs in their respective communities, and whereas 2023 marks the 63rd annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association, Canadian Public Works Association, with the theme this year of Ready and Resilient. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Kyle Schlechter, Mayor of the City of Littleton, do hereby recognize the week of May 21st through May 27th, 2023, as National Public Works Week in the City of Littleton, and urge all citizens to join with representatives of the American Public Works Association and government agencies in activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees to recognize the substantial contributions they make in protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. Uh, Public Works Director Keith Reister is here. He's going to try to follow up uh, on Chief Enley's. Uh, <laughs> good, good luck, Keith. I just said that to Chief Enley. I'm like, thanks. Appreciate that. For my whole career, uh, Public Works is always alphabetically after police um, when we kind of go through this. So this is my first time having to do that. Um, but thank you all for your support. Uh, we have 85 folks here in Public Works um, currently at the moment. And uh, we also have a huge network of private sector partners that help us deliver all the services that you see day in and day out. We certainly couldn't do that without all of our private sector partners, too. Um, you know, we, we love to work with our uh, other public safety first responders with police and fire. And, you know, a lot of those times the events are, we, we're there to clear the way for them. Um, or those kind of things. And we also know in disasters that those guys are usually gone after about, you know, 36 hours and we're left to clean up, which is great because that's what we do best. Um, so we thank you for all your support. Over the last um, several years, we've really tried to focus on providing the highest quality service for the most cost effective way for the community and continue to build Littleton into the place everybody wants it to be. So we appreciate your support. Um, and uh, you're always welcome to come and ride along or hang out in building two. So we appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Next item up is time for public comment. Uh, if you wish to address the city council on our public comment, please sign up on the sign-in form before the meeting. Uh, public comment is an opportunity to express opinions regarding issues that are not part of tonight's public hearings. Um, separate opportunity provided for comment at any public hearing. Uh, we don't have any uh, tonight. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. If you hit your three minutes, I will let you know. Uh, we expect comments to be civil, disrespectful, or disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. Council is not authorized under the Colorado Open Meeting Laws to discuss, comment, or take action at this meeting on any issue raised by public comment that is not part of tonight's agenda. I may refer issues to the city manager or attorney for immediate response or to staff to get feedback to council. Uh, when you come up, please say your name and your address, and you'll have three minutes. So. Hans Zilkanat, that's first. Well, thank you. Uh, it's uh, going to be tough to go after the last two uh, items on the agenda, so give it my best shot. So my name is Hans Zilkanat. Could you I'm speak into the microphone so oh. people watching can thank you. My name is Hans Zilkanat. I live at 5546 South Sycamore Street, uh, Unit B, literally a block away from here. Um, just a little bit about me. I've lived in the community now for about two and a half years now and uh, I was drawn to this community based on uh, just the vibrancy that it has the uh, great restaurants uh, access to public trails and it just wanted uh, more of a kind of an urban lifestyle and um, I've got essentially 35 years of aerospace experience and during that time I was a, a finance manager and also managed our facilities over in Centennial and have dealt with a lot of the same issues that I see us just dealing with on a recurring basis in our city. And so the reason I'm here is because of those recurring issues. And essentially over the last two years, I've seen issues over and over again as I use our trails, as I uh, access the Mary Carter Trail and I'm just seeing these issues over and over again and I'm kind of concerned that it doesn't appear that 
much is being done about them since they're, they're there on a daily basis. And those issues are, I'm kind of going through the list here, uh, public camping. We've got quite a bit of public camping that's being done, whether it's one night or multiple nights. And this tends to be the same over the last two years, it's the same three or four people I keep seeing over and over again, um, particularly where I, where I head. So public camping is one item. Um, public drug use, those same campers are uh, in open space on our sidewalks uh, using drugs. I mean, you can tell that drugs are being used, needles, uh, smoking marijuana, whatever it is. I mean, it's, that shouldn't be happening. Um, the other one that I find particularly offensive is just public defecation and nudity. They kind of go hand in hand. I'm um, seeing that over and over again as I'm cycling on the trails or walking down the trails. So I find that just rather, rather sad that that's happening in our community. And picture if you had a child that you were taking to, to the trails, do you, want to, do you want to have that happen? And how do you explain that to your kids? And uh, on top of that, the littering, the littering that goes along with the camping. You've got uh, shopping carts that are left on the trails. You've got just piles and piles of litter that are left there on a recurring basis. Um, and then, and so my ask is that the city come up with a recurring plan here and a, a measurable plan that's communicated to our citizens as to what we're going to do about this. Um, I, I believe in our community as uh, we talked about the police, as the great job that the public's work folks do. Um, I thank you. The, the clock something. has been stopped, but that's your three minutes. So All thank right. you. Well, thanks. Thank you for I coming am, down. Uh, I'm also available to help support this. I know it involves the community, so. Great, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Next up is Debbie Fox. Hi, my name is Debbie Fox, and I also live on Sycamore Street. I'm a resident here. And I have an extensive career in nursing. I served in the Navy as a Navy nurse. I've been in nurse management for a number of years. And um, I've also, for the past 10 years, been a case manager working um, with the homeless and lower income families. I moved here a couple of years ago as well. I have a private residence. And my initial attraction, like Hans, was the vibrant downtown, the fun shops, the fun restaurants, as well as the miles of walking and biking paths in the surrounding areas. And over the past two years, as an active cyclist and a runner, I've just grown disheartened with the daily confrontation of people illegally camping, littering, defecating, and using drugs, specifically along the Littles Creek Trail. Um, I see them every day. These individuals are filthy and unkept. They um, generate a tremendous amount of trash that uh, is scattered all along the walkway uh, and with no regard for people walking down that area. I've called numerous times to code enforcement and there's just been no improvement. Um, over the years, I've noticed how South Suburban does an excellent job in maintaining their pathways all along the plat and I wonder why can't the city of Littleton why aren't they unable to have the same standards just for a three block area? This area is truly the gateway to our downtown and it's just not happening. I see it every day. Um, over the past few years, I have friends and neighbors and they're selling their homes and they're leaving the area. And when asked, they say they're growing tired of the ongoing homeless situation and then the growth of mental health resources in the area. So I would like to know, what is the vision of Littleton? Um, it has so much potential for the enjoyment of our citizens as well as attracting others. And I too have offered over and over again to help or assist in any way. Thank you. Uh, that's all we have signed up. Is anybody else that would like to come and speak? Ms. Chadbourne.
Good evening, Council. My name is Pam Chabber, and I have a block and a half from here. So I have a couple of citations. They're from Wiktionary, the free dictionary online. It has a Creative Commons attribution and share alike license. So the word of the day for today is EON, relating to the dawn or the east. And that's because today is called the International Day of Light. It happens to be the day that uh, the first laser was fired, uh, kind of mixed message. But it's recognized by the United Nations to emphasize the importance of light, science, and technology in sustainable development and to celebrate the place of light in art, culture, and education. So I want to bring up the model lighting ordinance, which we uh, do not have now and we should. And I urge you to act as soon as possible to reinstall the model lighting ordinance-based lighting in our code. We should do that because we have a building boom, and so we need it now. We needed it two years ago. We should have had it in place before you all approved Denser and Aspen Grove. Um, not doing that to me is uh, bad, and I want you to be good. I want you to act well and put in that model lighting ordinance now um, because it relates directly to the quality of life of all citizens. I don't want anybody else's light in my home, and I don't intend to put my light in theirs. And that's their right, and my right, not to have light in my house that comes from someone else. It's totally right to put your light on your property for safety, and you want to illuminate. What you don't want to do is glare into everyone else's eyes or driver's eyes, um, because that's dangerous. So I could go on. I want to, again, acknowledge Councilmember Valdez for being on Planning Commission when the MLO-based lighting ordinance was passed um, and criticize the uh, presider uh, in place when, it was, uh, when he directed staff to uh, look at taking it out. That was wrong. So there are many. I could go on for an hour, and I obviously don't have the time. Second of all, I wanted to talk about the adoption of the DDA plan of development. I like, and I've been going to the meetings, the enthusiasm and motives of members of the DDA. There are good ideas for goals. And it's difficult to develop that team, but a plan, again, Wiktionary, is a person, thing, or situation, uh, 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 sorry, a set of intended actions usually mutually related through which one expects to achieve a goal. The plan of development is a hot mess, a person, thing, or situation in a state of pitiful disarray. It doesn't have um, a set of intended actions mutually related through which one expects to achieve any of those goals. So Thank you, um, I've got concerns about it. Thanks very much. Anybody else would like to speak? Ms. Talentire? Sorry, I got here late. Um, I want to speak about simplicity. I would like you to read to you some selections from a new book from Bemis Library, but the title really says it all. If it's smart, it's vulnerable by Miko Hipponen, cybersecurity expert. This is really not just a cybersecurity principle, but a physical principle as basic as the principle of entropy and closely related to that principle, actually. A construction guy will tell you the more features your roof has, fans, vents, skylights, chimneys, the more likely the roof will leak. If you build a fort, the simpler the walls are, the better. As soon as you build a door, you can go out. It's not something someone else can use to get in. And the Russian Kalashnikov gun was a simple brute of a gun, which has long been considered much more useful than the M16 because it didn't have as many features to keep breaking. Old cars that didn't do much but run, they're still running. Well, the electronic features on their successors made the cars not worth repairing when they broke. So when you really, really need things to work reliably over a long time, smart features are often a stupid way to go. So what Miko Hipponen said is, uh, the internet is the world's most complex machine. During a lecture, I once said that if a device is smart, it's vulnerable. The statement took on a life of its own and is now known as Hipponen's law. If it's smart, it's vulnerable. While Hipponen's law may be pessimistic, it is also true. By adding functionalities and communications capabilities to our devices, we are making them vulnerable. Take the wristwatch as an example. There is no way to hack a traditional wind-up wristwatch. 
A smartwatch can be hacked as it runs code and is online. A smartwatch is a vulnerable watch. A smart TV is a vulnerable TV. A smart home is a vulnerable home. A smart car is a vulnerable car, and a smart city is a vulnerable city. You may be wondering, since I'm the one saying this, uh, what this guy says about elections. You might not be surprised to hear he doesn't actually say much. Sort of like the doctors two years ago who didn't have a job anymore if they said anything like that, maybe we should know more about these vaccines before mandating a one-size-fits-all medical decision. In the same way, the fact that the publishing industry allowed this book, which is just generally very interesting, you should read it, and the guy has not been slandered, canceled, or jailed, tells me that the same government that lied about vaccines is happy with what he said. So, of course, he did not connect those dots, so I'm doing that for you. So, we are spending huge amounts of money for features that make elections vulnerable when all we need is the ability to count and perform simple addition. Tally marks on paper are simple, transparent, and unhackable, and way, way cheaper. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak tonight? Seeing no one, I'm going to see if the city manager has any response to anything. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I'd just like to comment regarding Mr. Zilkanot's comments that I know he has been in touch with, with council members and, and staff also and in, in response. Uh, since we've, we've been in, uh, in, in contact with him, the police chief has increased patrols and, uh, and awareness of our, for our police officers on those trail segments that he has referenced. Um, we're also deploying the uh, co-responders when appropriate to help with uh, mental health issues. Um, so that's kind of a, sh a short-term response, but I, I know council's aware, I'll, I'll mention for the public, that council has been very uh, you know, direct about their uh, priority for addressing these, these issues, both from the law enforcement and behavioral health aspects. And I know that will be a, a priority uh, longer term as we move, move into, in, into some, some long-term planning. An another long-term resource, since one speaker mentioned um, more about what the city's doing, the city is part of the Tri-Cities Homelessness Policy Group with Englewood and Sheridan. Uh, they have just launched, kind of a soft launch of a website, tricitieshomelessness.com. Com, I believe. I should check if it's org or com. It is com. Um, and that has a pretty extensive uh, number of pages on the actions that we're taking from a, um, from a more long-term uh, uh, approach for helping to, you know, address the issue that all of our, our, our communities are uh, dealing with. So just want to uh, mention those for the council and the public. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is consent agenda. Uh, we have three items on consent agenda tonight. Consent agenda items can be adopted by a simple motion. All ordinances must be read by a title prior to a vote on the motion. Any consent agenda item may be removed at the request of a council member. Item A is resolution 48, 2023, approving an MOU for the South Denver Metro Fiber Consortium. Item B is Resolution 51 2023, approving an amendment to the Intergovernmental Agreement with Mile High Flood District regarding final design, right-of-way acquisition, and construction of drainage and flood control improvements for Jackass Gulch at Highline Canal. Item C is ID 23109, motion to approve minutes of the May 2nd, 2023 regular meeting of the City Council. Councilmember Valdez. I move to approve. Consent agenda items A, B, and C. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Valdez, second by Councilmember Barr to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion, Council? Seeing none, I will open the voting. I don't have it on my screen here. Oh, there it is. All right. The vote is seven, uh, six in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. All right, next up, item nine, general business. We have one item on general business tonight. It's resolution 45, 2023, approving Littleton City Council's adoption of the Littleton Downtown Development Authority Plan of Development. Uh, so we'll have a presentation by staff, and council can ask any questions if we need to, and then we'll have a, a motion, discussion, and a vote. So, 
Turn it over to the city manager here. Thank you, Mayor. As council will recall, the uh, Littleton Downtown Development Authority was approved by voters in November of uh, 2022. Since that time, uh, the, the, the DDA has been working hard to develop bylaws and an intergovernmental agreement with the city. This piece tonight is the uh, plan of uh, development, which as you'll, you'll hear is a major uh, milestone and, and trigger for some of the important funding that the, uh, that the uh, DDA will, will rely on. So with that, I'll turn it over to Assistant City Manager Kathleen Osher, who will give an overview of the plan, and I can, she can also introduce our guests and representatives of the, the DDA. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Um, I feel like tonight is a little bit of a walk down memory lane. You've been following this process pretty closely over the last year or more. And um, our, tonight is an opportunity for us to kind of share some of that process, remind you of some of those steps you've taken. But as you know, this has been a formation year for the Littleton Downtown Development Authority. So this is one more step in the series of steps that are needed to, to for, fully form and um, also take full advantage of the tools that a downtown development authority provides for uh, both our businesses and residents in downtown. So with that, I am joined this evening by the director of the Littleton Downtown Development Authority, Jenny Starkey, to my left, and then on the end, Pat Dunahay, who served as the stakeholder committee chairman um, between 2020 and 2021. So. Let's get underway. Um, I'm gonna skip over that agenda, but just remind council that there was a 21 member committee um, that again engaged in a planning process and provided a reality check as we went through, also served as the, the chief coordination point for um, conversation in the community, uh, both a survey, focus groups, and other pieces of information. I think it was really important, um, the approach that was taken by the stakeholders to come together. And I think, um, Pat, if you wanna share a little bit about just forming the group and making sure that you had a variety of voices to, to really usher through what was a pretty great process. And if you'll remember, yep. We felt that it was necessary to engage the community in the broadest level that we could. So. We obviously had, and, and we had guidance and help from a counts, counselor that you all helped us hire, and that was to get uh, residents involved, business owners involved, um, landlords involved, stakeholders. Um, we truly tried to hear the process on the highest level that we could. Uh, we went out um, and had a couple, three different public uh, meetings. We also went to Western Welcome and exposed the process. Um, the, the most important thing that we wanted to resonate to the stakeholders was, this was an opportunity for the stakeholders to really get involved, take some of the monkey off of the city's back and make vibrant changes as we've heard tonight from some residents that we felt like were missing. We, you know, to look to you all to do all the events, to look to you all to do all of the landscaping improvements and all the things to make um, this community the way we wanted. We didn't feel like uh, that was a city responsibility, and I think you all pushed us to this point where uh, that we believed in this, so we went out and did that. I, I do want to add one thing before you vote to approve this, that th this is the marketing piece that we did go to the voters with. You know, we, we took that out on the street and said, this is what we know, check out our website. Um, we met with, you know, many, many people through the process, and Kathleen will give you some detail on that, but I think that we represented the city in a way that you would have wanted us to. We were pretty straight up with uh, what it was gonna look like, what it was gonna be, and we, I think, set a record for the amount of voters that there's ever been on a historic district in Colorado. You can check the statutes on Arvada, Cherry Creek, um, Castle Rock, uh, Fort Collins, um, all of them had anywhere from 200 votes to, um, well, some of them only had 75 or 80 votes, actually. I think Inglewood, um, the first round, and it didn't get passed. 
uh, I think the most I ever ever saw was 250 and we had 400 and some. So we all felt really good that we exposed it to the public the way I think you guys wanted us to. Um, so we just took direction from people we believe in and uh, did the best job with all that info that we could. And this was the plan and it's not organized completely right and it is a little messy. I, I don't argue that, but it's a great start uh, for us to have gotten the votes that we did and getting the property tax increase. Uh, all you, the number one complaint you hear from any resident in this city is a property tax increase. We, we got a property tax increase. People wanted this change big uh, or we wouldn't have gotten that. So we're, we're excited about the amount of money that's going to come in in a year from now to this DDA, and I, we're going to start taking bets on it. But uh, property taxes have gone up, is all you know. So the increment that we get on that in the three mil piece of that should add up where it could be a material change that all of us will feel great about. Any questions for me? <laughs> All right, I'm going to continue to walk us through the process, and if there are questions along the way, I'm happy to make Pat available okay. for those. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we recognized early in the process is when stakeholders come to the city, that is the, one of the more successful opportunities to really have a conversation about how downtowns can come together. We had a very um, sort of open approach to finding the right partner to engage us in a conversation about the feasibility of a downtown district, not jumping to a conclusion of whether or not it would be maybe a downtown development authority or a business improvement district, but really rely on the guidance of a consultant team that specializes in this work for downtowns. Progressive Urban Management Associates, or PUMA, uh, was our partner in that process, and they were able to take that 21-person stakeholder committee, create some structure and momentum around having those conversations, and guide us through a process to then come back to you, as you will remember, and say, we think there's some momentum here. We think we'd like to f explore those final steps um, and see if uh, this is something that could be successful with voters. So the objectives that we started with was really trying to understand the, the downtown market in particular, um, understand some of the programs and investments priorities, uh, understand that difference between those two different types of districts, and really to continue to engage a variety of stakeholders in downtown. And then obviously, um, Puma was there to help us think through those next steps of, of forming an actual district. So there were three phrases three phases that we went through, um, you know, really kind of thinking about that orientation and priority setting, thinking about potential improvements, um, and then obviously the legal process and election that you would remember from last November. One of the most important inputs for this process was really a communications and engagement uh, strategy that included a, a survey that had over 850 uh, responses as well as continued com uh, communication through the city website, social media. The DDA did establish their own website, and then also um, doing a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews, as well as roundtable and focus group discussions. So those survey results were really informative uh, on a number of different, uh, in a number of different ways, but most importantly, they helped us start to see where some of the improvements, where there was priority, where there was consensus among those stakeholders in downtown. So you kind of see that series of vision words that you may remember as we went through the formation process last year, safe, uh, parking being an issue, the idea of a, a vibrant downtown, clean, um, the sense of community, and maintaining its walkability. So those survey results, again, provided us an opportunity to better understand where priorities were, where we could start to see first tier, second tier, um, or third tier types of investments and priorities. We also had the opportunity to think about things like fiscal improvements, again, thinking about vacant storefronts where the, a, a district could be helpful in uh, providing more communication around the transition of particular properties. Uh, additional parking is, was something that came up pretty consistency, or consistently. The ambiance of downtown, the general um, sort of feel and ways that people felt engaged with downtown, making it more pedestrian friendly and accessible. So 
would the steering committee, as they did their work, came to the conclusion that a downtown development authority was really the more attractive tool. And so really the your understanding now of, of a DDA, and particularly as it goes through its formation, is that it becomes a great partner to the city. It is a quasi-public steward. It becomes a champion for downtown. It really is about the vitality and attractiveness of a downtown area. And it does provide four mechanisms for funding that include the tax increment that Pat talked about, as well as a mill levy or property tax. Um, state statute allows DDAs to explore up to five mills of property tax. Um, so knowing all of that within its structure, that's really where we started to look at other DDAs where, that have been successful, um, understanding their boundaries, understanding how that could play a role in, in the types of things that we wanted to look at in Littleton, and then really understanding sort of that general landscape of what DDAs offer to cities and how and what that partnership looks like. So we did uh, sort of a project comparison list among the DDAs that we identified in that earlier slide. Um, a lot of these projects deal with connectivity, um, so bike and pet improvements, the redevelopment, reuse, and activation of business spaces there and, and properties that are oftentimes in transition or sit vacant, um, thinking about signage, gateways, public art, beautification, streetscape. And where we see is a lot of overlap with the types of things in planning that the, the city has underway now with the downtown mobility and streetscape improvement plan. So we saw a lot of parity in that, and there was a huge opportunity to sort of lay the foundation for some of the activities that a partner could do, knowing that the city was looking to tackle that downtown mobility and streetscape improvement plan in 2023. The final boundaries, as you will remember, uh, stretch north to the 5151 apartments, south to include the Arapaho Community College, and then stretch across to uh, the river, and then really embrace the walkable land or walkable land use that we see uh, up to Crocker, and so that became the, the boundaries that then were presented to voters within them and um, sent to them as part of the election, which we'll cover in just a moment. The plan of development is really designed more to be a menu of services. It sort of governs the opportunity for the DDA to say these are the types of things that we have heard interest from. Here's how we could think about short-term, middle-term, and long-term projects that would fit within um, the, the type of work that the DDA could do. Where it really boiled down to the, the consensus were five areas, an improved parking experience, a well-connected downtown, beautiful and welcoming downtown, clean and safe, and then that business-friendly and vibrant. So as we started to look at the potential for projects, some of the things identified in the plan of development are short-term projects. Um, you can see where there is a, a sense of creating more understanding of where there is parking available. Um, Longer-term projects, you know, we have heard interest in, in maybe thinking about parking differently, concentrating it in either structured parking or other opportunities. I think there's a lot of work to, to get to that long-term project, but the plan of development really does allow the opportunity to kind of advance uh, what an improved parking experience can be like for, for customers there. Well-connected, the short-term projects, thinking about that connection back to the Mary Carter Greenway, um, really thinking of a, a, a safer and, and better connected route uh, for bicycling and walking, as well as things um, like a circulator, thinking about other improvements. I think one of the things that the, the DDA will enjoy and, and look to, to leverage and market is, of course, our raised crosswalks that, that are now under construction. Um, some of the longer-term projects, you know, really thinking about different facilities, potentially a pedestrian bridge that would connect the river to downtown. So I think there's a lot of opportunity that's sort of sketched out in a vision that the DDA in partnership with the city can, can start to explore what may make sense, what is priority, and what that timeline and funding may be. Beautiful and welcoming, really focused on um, things like a flower program, festival lighting, really activating the gateways, again, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, so that people recognize that they are entering a very special place um, that is an opportunity to really mingle and experience a very unique setting um, and a very unique downtown in, in sort of the southwest part of the metro region. 
Longer term projects will probably overlap greatly with our downtown mobility and streetscape improvement plan. There's a lot of parity in terms of how we think about um, the types of streetscape improvements and thinking about um, really creating a, a broader and greater sense of downtown beyond just some of the features that we see most commonly on Main Street. Clean and safe. Um, I would say that that is something that came across pretty clearly from focus groups and, and other conversations. The, the interest and need for security and really a great and vibrant partnership with our police department, thinking about street cleaning and maintenance, um, sharing in some of those services, really trying to, to find some um, opportunities where those costs could be shared and where some of those programs could be accelerated with the, with the partnership of the Downtown Development Authority. And then lastly, business friendly and vibrant really focuses on events, um, but also the marketing and promotion. I think there'll be a really fruitful and wonderful partnership with Visit Littleton. You may remember that from about, uh, I think about a month ago when council had a presentation during their study session. So I, I think that uh, tourism aspect and marketing and continuing to attract visitors to our downtown will be a huge partnership that will be explored as, as well. So the election results in November, I think you may all remember that um, the DDA and this, or the steering committee um, was brought to council the opportunity to bring this to directly to voters. So in, in uh, November then three questions were presented to the voters within the boundaries of the DDA. All three measures passed. Um, I believe that Pat is correct, that it was the largest number of votes of any recent DDA election. So I think it was um, a very large process to, to get out there and recruit votes. It is, it is um, very challenging sometimes. It is an, an unusual election, an unusual type of election. So it is a, a great opportunity that the steering committee really leaned into making sure that people knew um, that there was an opportunity to weigh in on whether or not a DDA could be formed. So those three questions all passing. And um, I think now, as you know, from the recent presentation that was made for the intergovernmental agreement that we solidified with the DDA that many of the activities are underway. And I would just give Jenny an opportunity to kind of share just how much progress um, they've made and just how, um, I think really from my perspective, how well the group is, is working together. And it's great to have staff on board. So. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, it's great to see you all. Thank you again for all of the support of the DDA. And Kathleen is right. Um, I've been involved in many uh, quasi-governmental organizations, and I've never actually seen such an engaged and um, present and passionate and willing board. And I say that um, with a lot of encouragement because we've been meeting uh, <laughs> twice a month, board meetings, and we have managed to accomplish quite a lot in just, I think I was brought on in... It doesn't matter. January. Just a, January, just a few <laughs> short months. Um, so the board has really pushed forward on making sure that everything um, in terms of the foundation of the organization is really rock steady. So we've uh, focused a lot on those foundational elements, everything from um, making sure that our business is registered correctly with the state, um, all the way down to EIN and PDPA banking numbers. So we're, we're just finishing up all of those things. So then when the plan of development is approved, we can immediately start um, approving an operating plan, a budgeting process to present to you for 2024, work with the county assessors to get an understanding of the, um, the properties in the district, create those business directories, the, the marketing communications, community outreach attempts through websites, e-communications, et cetera. And we're, we're just this close to getting there. So it's, uh, we're at a tipping point. I think the community really wants to hear from the DDA what it is that we're up to, what it is that we foresee and forecast for the next couple of months and the next couple of years. And um, as soon as we're able to move forward with this plan of development, I'll be presenting a draft operating plan to the board tomorrow night that um, takes this plan of development and puts it into manageable chunks for a year-long process. And then we do that again for 2024. And we keep just compounding all of the efforts until we are able to say, this is done and we're ready to move on with the next planning effort, whether that be a five, 10, 15 year plan, so. Okay. 
So before council this evening is the Littleton Downtown Development Authority plan of development. State statute requires that this plan of development be reviewed and a recommendation be advanced to council from planning commission. So that meeting was held and planning commission unanimously uh, recommended approval for council for the plan of development. And so with that, we would love to answer any additional questions that you may have. Um, and uh, I won't say anymore. So. Council, any questions regarding this resolution? Councilmember Driscoll? Not so much about the resolution, but we had two open spots that were uh, available. Um, can you give us a quick update on those? Uh, how many applications we had? And, uh, and maybe you know when they're coming to in front of council to interview. Yeah, so it is still an open application through the end of this month. State statute, as you may remember, has um, written into it uh, the um, staggering of board terms so that that becomes part of the long-term um, governance of DDAs. So within the first formation year of a DDA, when it's passed in November, that following June 30th, the first two members um, expire, or their terms expire. <laughs> so, Let's hope they don't, so uh, just the terms are open. Their so. terms, yes, their terms expire. So uh, we have advertised that for, I think, roughly five weeks. Um, we've made that application uh, available. My understanding is that the two current members that have served now for six months are reapplying for that, and then other members of the of the community are also encouraged. So I don't know if there's uh, maybe an update that city clerk can provide in terms of applications, but that does remain open through the 31st. Correct. Um, that will remain open through uh, end of business on the 31st. We do currently have five applications, including applications for reappointment from the two current serving members. Great, thanks. Any other questions on this? Councilmember Barr. Yeah, I, when we made the initial appointments, this is kind of winging off of Councilmember Driscoll's question, um, we didn't have applications from the Riverside District, or we, were we able to uh, have any outreach to any of those businesses? Have they become I'm, more engaged? I'm gonna, let's try to keep focus on the resolution here rather than that's a, a slightly different topic here. Getting We're kind of getting into the weeds there. Okay, so. no worries. Anything about approving the plan of development? I'm sorry, Steve Dobbs talking. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have a question, probably for Jenny. Um, so what is the, uh, let's assume that this passes, or if this passes, what's the next step? I know you, you kind of talked about that with the operational plan there, um, but what, you know, what are the kind of those other milestones, um, maybe st in statute that uh, uh, are needed to hit with this passing? Good question, Mayor, thank you. Um, so currently right now, like I said, we'll be moving forward with uh, hopefully approving a operating plan to get us through to about April of 2024, which is when we could expect to see the first um, uh, you know, revenue dollars coming in to, su to support our 2024 efforts. So immediately approving an operating plan, approving, um, we're, we'll conduct a public hearing to amend our budget. And then as soon as that's done, we will also turn around to put in the 2024 budget. Um, what the operating plan and discussions, what we've, um, how Puma did their research with the community and the steering committee, all the outreach that they did, it gave us a lot to go off of in terms of what those immediate um, wants, which is needs are for the community as well as the long term. So in the operating plan, we're identifying all of those to start moving forward immediately with things uh, that we can contribute to, such as the, um, uh, I just refer to it as DIMSIP, but Downtown Mobility Streetscape and Improvement Plan will be uh, very partnering very closely with the city on that entire process. We'll have a liaison throughout to make sure that anything that's happening over the next three to five years um, in the uh, streetscape and mobility infrastructure planning or improvements plan will um, be taken care of, or I'm sorry, will be included in our budgets and our work plan. We'll also be looking at um, moving forward with additional, I mean, I think I'm just repeating myself at this point, but additional community outreach to make sure that we're serving those, our stakeholders and constituents that voted us in, um, and even those that didn't vote us in. And then in 2020, 
four in April, we'll get a much better understanding of what we're actually capable and able of doing. Um, currently, we don't have any information from the county's, county assessors of what our baseline budget or revenues are going to be for December 2022. So it's really hard to um, prophetize of what past April 2024 is gonna look like for us because it's a big question mark of just how much money do we have that we're able to make an impact with. Does that help answer your yeah, question? Yes, great, thank you. And just tell Cal not to appeal his assessment there, and that might help. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Valdez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, uh, thank you for putting this together, Jenny. I, you've done a great job hurting these uh, folks up over there. I know that could be difficult with some of those characters. I, I've written a lot of business plans in my day, and, and you're doing it with, what, 21 members, basically, and putting uh, the pieces in place and, and how you're going to get there and who's going to do what and make it accomplished. Um, but anyway, uh, I think you're off to a great start. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. It just jogs one thing that I do want to mention. We've done a couple of brainstorming sessions so we can address what low-hanging fruit is that has been identified by the community as really important for downtown. And I do think, to your point, Councilman, is that there's just so much to do, and the board has just really been itching to get to what they're calling, referring to the fun stuff. Um, when we start more planning and looking at budgets, uh, they might not call it fun anymore, but um, low-hanging fruit will really be something that we're trying to address um, immediately. So, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, is there a motion? Mayor, I move to approve resolution 45-2023 approving Littleton City Council's adoption of the Littleton Downtown Development Authority Plan of Development. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Barr and a second by Councilmember Driscoll. Uh, any further discussion, Council? Anyone else? Councilmember Melman? I you? just want to echo uh, Jerry's comments. I'm so excited for this uh, DDA and the plan of development and what's going to happen in the future. You're just getting started, but you are doing a great job and keep it up and please let us know what else we can do to support y'all. Councilmember Barr? Yeah, I just wanted to echo and say the plan is really well thought out. I like the kind of comprehensive understanding of short and long-term goals in each of the subcategories. Um, I hope you'll have metrics in place to measure some of those short-term outcomes. I think those are the things that we want to not only see, but um, kind of proselytize for you and, and shout out to the rest of our community. So thank you again for all the work that you've put in, and I'll ask my question on the sidebar, I guess. Any other comments? Uh, I'll just uh, add in there that, yeah, I think that, you know, the, this may be not be perfect, but, you know, not much really is. So I think it's a really good, as I think you put it as a game plan of um, a, you know, a menu of options of things that can be done that kind of focuses the DDA on these are the major topics that we want to address in our downtown and how we're going to do that. And then those, I think those operational, um, you know, each annual plan is really going to uh, get to that and get that. So, you know, I don't, I don't think I would refer to this uh, document as a, a hot mess, as I think was earlier said. I think it's, it's pretty good and uh, lots of uh, good ideas in there. And is everything going to be exactly how it's uh, it written there? Probably not. But, you know, this is a, a good focus and a good step for the DDA. So I'm excited to see uh, where uh, they move forward here. So uh, I will be uh, supporting this resolution. So. And without anyone else, I'm going to open the voting. The vote is six in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you. All right. Have, have fun getting to those, those fun things there. All right. Next item on the agenda, item 10, is ordinances on second reading and public hearings. We have none tonight. Uh, and then item 11, uh, we need a motion to adjourn into executive session. Mayor, I move to go into executive session pursuant to CRS 24-6-402 and Article 3, Section 27 of the City Charter for purpose of discussing performance evaluation for the City Manager and the City Attorney. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, is there any further discussion? Let me try to get to the vote here. So we have a motion a second to go into executive session. It should be open. Councilmember Grove. Over there. 
The vote is six in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, the City Council has voted six to zero in favor of going into executive session for the purpose of discussion of the City Manager's and City Attorney's annual review. No formal action can occur in an executive session. At the conclusion of the executive session, Council will return to the regular meeting here in this Council Chamber uh, where we will not have any further uh, business. We are adjourned into executive session. Council will meet upstairs in the Manager's um, conference room.
are back from the executive session with no more uh, action on tonight's agenda. We are adjourned at 9.06 p.m. <laughs>